Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Scarlett, how was your weekend? I spent a lot of it watching baseball, I gotta admit. Go Yankees. Go Yankees, yes. And All right. Boo Dodgers. All right, go Yankees. Let's get to the biggest stories right now in the more than $14 trillion global ETF industry. And as traders start to pair back wagers on Fed rate cuts after that strong economic data we've been getting, we'll discuss the rapid expansion of the active fixed income ETF market. And we speak to Matt Markovich of Trader ETFs on the launch of the first quarterly reset leveraged funds in the industry. And an Alabama man has been arrested for hacking the SEC X account back in January after posting ahead of its highly anticipated decision to approve rather spot Bitcoin ETFs. I think we're all still recovering from that. So a nice full circle moment. But as always, Eric Baltunas from Bloomberg Intelligence, he's here with us now looking at the flows. Eric, what do you got? Katie, Scarlett, while Scarlett was watching baseball, ETF investors were plowing into equities. Look at these numbers, 7.5 billion. That is a lot for SPY, even as big as it is. This is the trading crowd here. Now, VU is the retail Vanguard bid. VU with 3.2 billion. Again, I know we get so used to this, but it puts this number up every week. It's now 80 billion on the year. The old annual record is 50. So we're 30 billion beyond the record, and it's still October. Unbelievable year this thing's having. And then the queues. So look, you've got like traders, retail, all here involved in the market with big flows. Can't get much rosier. TLT is interesting. That's the long dated bond. More on that in a minute. Okay, I'm going to put bonds over here for a second. I bid in gold. I bid had a huge uh, uh, week with 1.14 billion. This is now the third most flow getting ETF of the year. Insane stat for a newborn. That never happens. GLD finally getting some love. It's been doing great all year, but the flows only came in the last month. Maybe because of the Bitcoin competition. I don't know. Let's look at the outflows. Not much to report here. Most of these numbers are just too small to care about. Look, there's nothing in the billions. So really, all the money just basically went into ETFs last week, and most investors are uh, very much on the bullish side, whether that's gold or equities. Now, let's look at that TLT. Bonds are interesting. So bonds, you know, the Fed lowered rates, obviously, by 50 basis points. Then it was like, well, they might not do it again. What's going to happen? So this is a confusing area right now. These are the three, these three lines are the maturity buckets. So here you have uh, short term. This is long and intermediate. Well, I'm going to focus on long. Look at long. People buying in, buying in. Then the rate cut. The rate cut. And then right here, look at this. The only one in October that's up is the long dated treasuries. Intermediate continue to sell off short. No real interest in a couple months. What, you know, whether this uh, determines whether they're expecting more rate cuts, yet to be determined. But people do love to bet around the TLT. They've been burned before. Maybe they'll be right this time, Katie. All right, Eric, thank you. And let's keep the conversation going now with Kay Hur. She is CIO for Global Fixed Income, Currency, and Commodities over at JP Morgan Asset Management. Joining us at the desk, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. And I think the last time the Dodgers and Yankees were in the World <laughs> Series was 1981. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I bet an ice cream, a 10 cent ice cream, Did at you school win? lunch. I bet on the Dodgers in one, but I don't think betting on baseball is what I do anymore. <laughs> I think I'm more interested in active fixed income. So well, thank you very much for having me. Great segue. And let's talk about that, where people are placing their bets when it comes to the uh, fixed income market right now. As Eric walked through this, there's been a revival of the bid for duration. And you think about the active debate that the market is having right now about the Fed's rate cutting trajectory. Does that bid into duration make sense at this juncture? So there's a lot embedded in the question that you just asked me. So I think I'd like to unpack it and yes. parse it. So I think the first thing is active versus passive. If you look over the last decade, the growth of active ETFs has been double that of passive ETFs. So I think the market has spoken loudly and active is the way to go in fixed income. Um, why is that? You get the benefits of active management, so research, security security selection and portfolio construction, then you also have the benefits of the ETF. So that daily liquidity, the daily, the intraday liquidity and the pricing and the transparency, being able to see what everybody owns on a daily basis. So we are big supporters of active ETFs. Mm. On the topic of duration, which is a completely separate topic, um, I think it's important to remember two things. Number one, we have a, a record high in the amount of money in money market funds. So mm -hmm. broadly, the American consumer is massively underweight duration and has a lot of, lot of CDs, money markets, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the move into duration makes a lot of sense because I think people are underweight duration. 
Now, what is that predicated on? You know, our view is that the U.S. economy is in a soft landing. So soft landing, the Fed has cut rates 50 basis points. And yes, there's an awful lot of debate about whether they're going to go in November, in December, next year, how many times. But I think broadly, the Fed has telegraphed that rates go lower from here. And that is a great backdrop for adding duration. So um, you mentioned a couple of things. I want to pick up on one of them, which is active versus passive. Um, Four or five years ago, there was a lot of concern that active ETFs would give away the secret sauce of uh, portfolio construction. There would be all these bandwagon investors jumping on, getting a free ride by mimicking the holdings. Has any of that come to pass? I, I hate to say it, but good luck with that. The <laughs> ETF that I run, uh, 2,973 line items. If anyone here thinks that they can replicate that <laughs> without the benefit of a global research platform, risk management, and everything else, they can have it. Let's so, talk. yes, we publish daily what we own in our ETFs. And you show it out there and no one's uh, getting a free ride. I, I, yeah. When we talk about active-passive, uh, one thing I've noticed over the past 15 years is, as you said, bond managers have it a little easier. Stock pickers. Wow, that hurts. <laughs> yeah, well, look, we like to think let me we're give smarter. You my theory. We've got all that complex math going on. But okay, <laughs> fine, I've got an easy I job. I feel like Good advisors feel like you're playing chess when stock pickers are playing checkers. Because there's time involved, there's more bonds. But the other thing is the index. The ag is, eh. It's, you begging are you it's not that to great. Say that? the Bloomberg ag? I know. I'm not going to diss That's how Bloomberg authentic my, is, my statement this is. This is Eric's view. That's how, not, yeah. So, so, so can you talk about that? The ag has no high yield. It has very little corporate. It's a lot of treasuries. Is that the right index? And is that part of why the bond managers seem to avoid the passive out, the flows? So a couple of things here. Number one. Active management is hard, whether you're in equities or in fixed income. We have succeeded in beating the benchmark over, I think, 99% of rolling periods. But the, the important point about the benchmark is this. The ag only includes 53% of the investable bond market. So you're right, high yield is not included. You know, we have significant investments in asset-backed securities, which are also, for the most part, excluded. But I think it's also important to remember or to focus on, if you're investing in ETFs, risk-adjusted returns. So people aren't just looking to beat a particular benchmark. You have to be very conscious of risk-adjusted returns. I think when you're investing in ETFs, you should make sure you're underwriting a platform that has risk management and a focus on that. So I think you all know at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, we're the leader in active fixed income. We run more than $40 billion. So if someone is purchasing one of our ETFs that they can buy in the market, they're getting the same institutional approach to asset management. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how uh, active you need to be in, for example, the government bond space versus the corporate credit space, because much has been made about how tight corporate spreads are. Both of you look at high yield, if you take a look at investment grade, and we have seen hefty flows coming out of HYG, LQD, for example, this year. And a lot of people have pointed to those tight spreads and said this is a complacent market. But I'm curious, I mean, how your active managers are navigating in that space. So a couple of things. If you believe the soft landing that I have articulated, then that's a great environment for corporate bonds, so investment grade and high yield, and also securitized credit. So I think that's the first point that I would make. Um, in terms of the spread question, you're absolutely right. If you go look at high yield spreads, they are in about the fifth percentile. So very expensive versus history. However, if you look at yields, re yields are actually about the median. Mm -hmm. So it's this whole yield versus spread. And when I think about investors, they don't eat spreads. You know, <laughs> yield are what help people in retirement. And when you're looking at seven and a half, eight percent yields there, you're looking at five percent, five and a half percent in investment grade, it's hard to argue with those types of yields. Now, speaking of yield, what about going even further out into the credit risk? Because what, what about this theory that like, oh, well, what if there's defaults? Well, will the government really let there be a wave of defaults? Like, so isn't it like more safe to go way out, say to like triple C's? Why not? I mean, what's the, what's the case against that? Yeah, so I think for any investment, you should really look at the risk return. I see you're goading me. I'm not sure what you want me to say, but I'll say what <laughs> we think. We personally think that the double BB is the more attractive component. Yes, triple C's have rallied pretty significantly. And yes, the government absolutely will get, let high yield bonds default. Go back to 2020 in the post COVID world, 6% of the high yield benchmark defaulted. So it's highly unusual, it, except for some sort of malfeasance mm. for there to be defaults in investment grade, but high yield absolutely 
absolutely default. Right now, back to your comment on spreads, high yield is there's roughly 10 percentage points higher, higher quality double Bs, so it's higher quality benchmark. So our outlook for defaults is more sanguine than what we've seen historically. But high yield absolutely can can default. So buyer beware on that. Can we just be honest about what we're talking about? We're talking about X triple C. I I'm, love this ETF. Bring this ETF. Well, Eric brings this ETF up all the time. It's just triple C bonds. Uh, you're not really seeing the bid for it though, even in this really. That's kind right. Of frothy. I, I, we have an expert bond manager. I was just curious why yeah. why not? Why not just bet I want the someone house to tell on me not why C's. I shouldn't do it. <laughs> Good luck with that, Eric. That's not how we choose to invest. And like I said, if you've got, if you're buying thousands of one-off bonds and you're trying to take advantage of bottom-up security selection and also the duration and the credit, I think it's a little more complex than you've made it out to be, Eric. But good All luck right. with that. Good luck with that. That's a great place to leave it. Uh, Kay, so enjoyed this conversation. Really appreciate you stopping by. That, of course, is Kay Herr of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Now, coming up, it caused chaos back in January. And now a man has been arrested over the hacking of the SEC X account ahead of the spot Bitcoin ETF approval. We'll discuss next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. It's time now for the ETF Brief, where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with the shrinking share of small caps. We're actually talking about mutual funds here, but I love this so much that I wanted to show it, that basically if you take a look at active small cap equity mutual funds, they only hold 16.4% of, of small caps on average. You compare that to a decade ago, that number was closer to 52%. So these small cap managers increasingly cheating up and buying the bigger stocks. We'll continue to keep an eye on that one. But let's also talk about some plans for some new, really innovative ETFs. I love this so much. So these are Battle Shares ETFs, uh, and they're basically for pair trades. Some of these pairs make a lot of sense. NVIDIA versus Intel, Tesla versus Ford. Then it gets a little bit kooky. Uh, you have Coinbase versus Wells Fargo, long Coinbase, short Wells Fargo, long MicroStrategy, short JP Morgan. So a really specific worldview there. It's going to be fascinating to see if these ones launch. But speaking of worldviews, let's talk about Bitcoin. Do you remember back in January when uh, the <laughs> SEC's Twitter, now X account, tweeted that the, the spot Bitcoin ETFs were yes. approved and everything went crazy. I was on air and we reported it because it happened, but it turned out that was a fake tweet. It was a fake tweet. And now the FBI has arrested the man who actually hacked into the Twitter account. Ah, finally. The we got months there. Months after the fact. All right, let's talk more about this issue with Bloomberg's Eric Larson, who is on the legal team and has been reporting on this. So, Eric, uh, there was one person arrested. What do we know so far about this individual? Um, honestly, not too much. His name is Eric Count. Council Jr. Uh, he lives in Athens, Georgia, uh, sorry, Alabama, and he was uh, arrested last week by the FBI agents, as you said, after this investigation. It's kind of a forgotten story. It seems like it was so long ago and then oh, out yeah, of nowhere. Yeah, we still, <laughs> yeah. still remember. And, you know, out of nowhere they announced this arrest. And it was kind of surprising. He was obviously a young guy and there was a lot of details not included in the indictment hmm. that we're still sort of wondering about. A lot of co-conspirators who are not named, who are actually directing this young man uh, through this entire uh, process uh, that started with, uh, you know, identifying a victim, someone who presumably worked at the SEC, oh. not identified in the indictment just by initials, and uh, somehow found out that he or this person had access to the SEC X account and then moved on from there. Uh, it was just wild. I mean, you did see the price of Bitcoin spike by $1,000, then quickly come down by, I think, $2,500. For Bitcoin, though, that's pretty normal volatility. But how serious of a crime is this? I mean, what sort of punishment could we be looking at here? Well, he's gonna be facing years in prison. Oh. Uh, of course, he could get a reduction if, for example, they find additional defendants and you know they can flip on each other and things like that. But it's very serious identity theft um, and accessing a stolen device. Um, in this case, he was able to do a so-called uh, SIM swap where they got the SIM card from the victim um, used uh, an AT&T store, convinced them like at the retail level to switch the SIM card to the, a fake person and then went to an Apple store and got a new iPhone and had it added in there and then the, moved, on, moved on from there and they wow. did it all in one day. 
So there's no indication that he was necessarily out to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. He was just kind of working with these other people. Right. That's what's so interesting here, because it seems like he was actually paid in Bitcoin for his services. Ah. They don't say how much. But the implication is that these co-conspirators were the ones leading everything. And they don't say if there were some trades done behind the scenes. We may not actually know who these people are yet. Uh, but the, And they're still at large. They're still at large, as far as we know. Uh, the implication would be that they would have made some trades there. You, you mentioned that the price uh, shot up $1,000 and then went down 2000 But obviously, someone could have made some money in that time for this relatively low-budget crime. Mm -hmm. All right. Eric Larson, thank you so much. Uh, keep us up to date on what's going on with this. Uh, Eric Larson of Bloomberg News' legal team. Now, still ahead, we're going to speak with Matt Markovich of Trader ETFs on how it's giving investors the longest leverage investment horizon available in the industry. These are supposed to be day in and day out, right? Yeah. No, it's fascinating. Of course, this is a boot booming area of the ETF industry. So really looking forward to this conversation. This is ETF IQ. I'm Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu along with Katie Greifeld. And Eric Balchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence back with us now for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, hit it. KD, today we're looking at Spy Q, which sounds like a combination of Spy and the Qs. I'm sure someone <laughs> will do that someday. But no, this is Spy Quarterly Leverage. So Trader 2X Long Spy Quarterly ETF. So we all know leverage ETFs. They go 2X or 3X in index, right? Or a stock. The one beef with these that people have is they reset the leverage every day. So over the medium or long term, if there's volatility, it can corrode the returns. You don't get the 2X or 3X. They have to reset it every day for new people who come in. So anyway, this one aims to solve that by resetting the leverage quarterly. So that's the important word here. They have monthlies as well, and I believe weeklies. So you get 2x spy reset quarterly. And we'll go over here. They're pricey 1.3%. But you know nobody really has fee sensitivity because they usually trade these. So the expense ratio less important. You can see the 2x there actively managed. It's um, just came out this month, right? It's uh, less than a month old, $5 million so far. Let's look at what it holds. So like most leverage ETFs, it holds swaps. Uh, the swap contracts are basically bar bets with uh, one of the big banks uh, that they write to people uh, who are worthy. And so they're basically giving you these daily, or um, in this case, quarterly promises to do that leverage. Uh, and that's how leverage ETFs work. Let's look at the returns of this. So I put the 2X daily resetting SPY in here, and I also put SPY itself. So you can see the lines here. This one, it, SPY Q and SPY U are SPU, rather, are right on top of each other. Not enough time has come for them to have some separation. But if there's volatility, I'm telling you, this number, the one that resets daily, will start to go down. This one should last better. Uh, but both are about double SPY as we speak, which is what you'd want to see. So this will be interesting, uh, Katie. I know a lot of volume and interest around these leverage products. Here's another way to do it. All right, Eric, thank you. And joining us now to talk about this ETF, I'm pleased to say we have Matt Markevich. I focused on that one. He is head of product and capital markets over at Trader ETFs. Great to have you join us on set. Thanks for having me. So at this point, it seems like most everyone who's probably watching this show is familiar with the daily leverage reset ETFs. But talk to us a little bit. Just set the scene about what problem you're trying to solve with these. Yeah, so what we found is that most investors actually hold those daily reset products for longer than a day and much longer, actually. So. For most investors, that's not really a suitable time horizon to have a daily reset product. And the SEC and FINRA are pretty clear that they warn you really should only hold these for a day. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to solve that problem of getting the leverage that you're looking for over a longer period of time. But by longer period, we're talking about each calendar quarter. What happens if you don't want to hold it for that entire period and you want to exit, say, after two weeks? Just like any ETF, that's up to you. You can do that, yeah. But will you know what the leverage looks like before you sell? You will, yeah. So you can get an idea of exactly this is how much I'm going to get. How, how long do you anticipate most holders to hold on to this ETF for then? Well, for instance, there is the uh, daily um, S&P 500, SSO is that ticker. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found that most people hold it 21 trading days. Mm. So they're holding a daily product mm. for actually, funny, a calendar month. So you guys have, it, I, it's smart. You did the big popular indexes, the Qs and the S&P 500. Um, what, what else are we talking about here? How wide could this go? What else do you plan to add this sort of 2x with longer resetting dates to? Well, we went effective on 47 ETFs in the prospectus. 
So you'll notice there's some small cap in there, uh, FXI for China. We have a few sectors, uh, the state treat sector spiders are in there as well. Uh, but really, Eric, it's sort of limitless in terms of if there's an ETF on it, we can have a leveraged product on it most likely. What about 2X NVIDIA? <laughs> <laughs> hear me out here. This is the, the meme. You're of, just hear me pitching out. this yeah. show. 2X NVIDIA, that one's $5 billion, 2X NVIDIA. You could do that one monthly or weekly. Would you move into the single stock area? Well, we do. We have a 1.75 times weekly NVIDIA. As NVDW is that ticker. So the problem is once you get to into more volatile assets, you can't really stretch out the reset period with that high amount of leverage. Mm. And so it's interesting, of course, uh, by moving away from that daily reset, you're minimizing the risk of volatility drag, especially if an investor is holding this for 21 days on average. But there's a different type of monitoring that you need to do to get the exact experience ad, ad, as advertised, you still need to buy and sell exactly on the reset periods, right? Well, you wouldn't have to buy and sell it. You could hold it for longer, Katie, but that leverage will just, let's say, SPY Q, for instance, will give you 200% the quarterly return of SPY if you bought it right at the end of the previous quarter and sold it right at the end of you know the, the following quarter. So you still get the leverage in between, but it's not necessarily going to be two. There's an effective leverage right. there. So to get the experience, though, you do have to monitor for that. Correct. Just like the dailies, you have to monitor it every day. So I'm curious uh, who is going to be buying these ETFs, so obviously institutional and retail, but what's the breakdown? Is it 50-50 or is it more skewed than that? We'll see. One of the interesting things is that it's, you know this leverage and inverse market is $100 billion of assets, right? And it's growing you know, a lot because the market is expanding and just the value. But what we found is there are a lot of uh, intermediaries, financial advisors, RIAs that aren't allowed to use leveraged products hmm. because of that daily reset. So it comes down to an issue of suitability. Mm -hmm. And if you're investing for people as a fiduciary for the longer term, you shouldn't be putting them in a daily reset product. All right, and then you know, 30 seconds. The key to, the key to these is to get one hit quickly, one that just starts to get some volume. Which one do you think is going to run away and be like your blockbuster potentially. Socks M, that's our monthly uh, 2x monthly rebalanced Socks, which is the iShare Semiconductor ETF. Uh, just given the interest in semiconductors and Nvidia, uh, it's been trading fairly actively for a new ETF um, and get, garnering some momentum. To me, I feel like that I feel like that's where we can be uh, the most popular. All right, Socks M, we will keep an eye on that one. Really great to have you here to break down these products. And of course, is Matt Markevich of Trader ETFs. And you can read about this drill down, plus the latest in the ETF industry when you subscribe to my weekly ETF IQ newsletter. That is Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. But that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ, the television show. I'm Katie Greifel, along with Scarlett and Eric, and this is Bloomberg.